Hey everybody, I hope you're all very well. It's 6.06 .06 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and uh, it's supposed to be July 7th. Uh, I'm sorry, no, July 26th, 7.26, 2018. That's what it's supposed to be. Um, that's what my computer says. So, um, I'm doing some some filling space right now. Because we're uh, just at a temporary impasse with uh, Fomenko because I've had a gentleman email me recently that has decided to take me up on the challenge that I offered. Anybody who believes that Fomenko's methods and systems of math and statistics that he's using to... Uh, create his um, his wave or splash graphs to compare historical chronicles with and also uh, the um, well the chronology mapping which I showed some of it in, in the last reading because I went through and I skipped a lot of those sections because they were just so uh, math and equation laden and most people listening to this who are intelligent people are still going to find that to be hard to listen to or just hard to follow um, <clears throat> even even if you're pretty good with math you probably still find that a little bit hard to follow and so after discussing the maximum correlation principle and Fomenko's math, the basis of the MCP and his chronological mapping with a subscriber uh, for some time who is an engineer and quite adept with math who had explained the issues with Fomenko's parameters to me in depth and actually had created various tables himself and sent them to me which I still have and doing quite a lot of work on it myself to try to determine how accurate uh, that those models that he's using the form that he's using would be I then concluded that his MCP and uh, chronological mapping are not as accurate as he would make them out and furthermore um, in the cases where they may be accurate there is also then the matter of the assumption that what's taking place is that a certain amount of history that happened what he believes uh, in the Middle Ages was actually duplicated backwards I find that uh, I find that part of the theory to be even more repugnant than some of the problems I have with the parameters of his mathematical statistical systems. Um, so that's why I offered the challenge. I, I said just anybody who believes that Fomenko is is really rock solid with what he's doing. In, with his MCP and chronological mapping that they should take the the body of his work and distill it and present it in a way that I think the average person could understand what he's doing and how he is setting all of his parameters and the allowances that he is making and then how he is arriving to the conclusions that he is arriving to because I don't think it's I know the word honest is a it's a harsh word but you know I when you when you consider how he handled so far biblical texts and we're not talking about a matter of having a uh, just a disagreement over um, translational 
anomalies or issues, because there, there can be those, this was a clear matter of just really giving definitions of words and phrases that were so far removed from anything that anyone could prove and then run with them that I have to think that if he's willing to do that with biblical texts, then he's willing to do that with his math and statistics, parameters of those statistics to arrive at the place that he has. So I answered this gentleman uh, briefly who sent me this email. I did say this, and this I'm saying to anyone who actually thinks that Fomenko's system is is honest and it's and it's right on including his theories about um, duplicating backwards instead of the other way around um, I'm not the adversary of anybody who believes that this sort of thing is possible or probable historically I'm not I wouldn't do the amount of readings that I have or continued for I think it's turning into years now to every time I say the date give an indication that I don't believe that date because I still don't but as with any other line of study and inquiry we have to stay consistent you see if if I start I, okay, so I spend most of my time before I even ever make a video in the morning in, uh, and mostly in what's called the Old Testament and uh, the source language, which it's, it's from, from everything we know that to our best knowledge, the source language of the Old Testament is what's called Hebrew, and I call it Obri, O-B-R-Y. That's what I spend most of my time in. And besides spending my time in trying to understand the language and the actual character that's used which you'll see in the middle of my uh, desktop screen right now I have written out in English orientation from left to right the 22 known characters that make up the Obri alphabet uh, I designed that font based on everything I could possibly find uh, concerning manuscripts or stones or anything else uh, and then I uh, designed those uh, based on majority of what I saw I'm not saying those are all absolutely correct nor am I saying our understanding of those characters is correct I don't believe it is I believe we need to understand it but that's what I spend my time doing and then in a secondarily I spend my time looking at the problems with geography. The geography being the notion that Palestine and Egypt and those outlying areas, I guess all the way over to Mesopotamia, north of that, uh, and yeah, northern areas of Palestine were places where uh, the events of the Bible occurred. <clears throat> I, I simply don't see a straight correlation between the descriptions that I see of this place and what I understand um, Palestine, Egypt, and outlying areas to be today. It's, and it's not just a matter of how things can change, because things can change. For instance, um, many people have built dams and created lakes. Many people have... Uh, built canals which have changed the the water systems in any given place um, and that's happened since these things were recorded and that can have a marked effect changing uh, the natural course of just about anything can have a very marked effect on the environment and I agree with that However, I would have to say at this point in time that even though I see in the text 
A number of clues that would make me think, well, gosh, this does really sound a lot like maybe Palestine, Egypt, and outlying areas. At the same time, I see so many other things that are so anomalous and so undefinable and unexplainable in a context of Palestine, Egypt, and outlying areas that I do wholeheartedly believe that a very thorough and honest examination of the factors present throughout scriptures uh, are necessary and then they have to be applied to what we can understand about those geographical locations. Currently, I am still working on a paper that is trying to get as close as possible to understanding, for one thing, the grazing needs of the patriarchs. So, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob's twelve sons, and then the whole nation of Yisrael at the time that they would be coming out of Matsrim, so the Exodus. We would need to know that for me to continue in, I would say, a more enlightening way uh, to go through that Exodus to entrance chart. That would be a lot further or furthering our understanding a lot more than most of everything that we have heard up to this point. Uh, now, right now, I'm still having to do some calculations based on everything that I've learned about Abraham. And some of this stuff is probably going to be a shock to some people because um, nobody that I'm aware of have, has done these things. Um, at the same time, as I've mentioned in recent videos, the, the Strong's list of Obri words, which are just Obri, none of them are the Chaldean entries or Aramaic entries, whatever you want to call them, and without any annotations or changes, uh, from myself that is prepared as is the font to be published and I'm currently trying to find the best format to publish this on and then getting the time uh, to understand this format and do it in a way that is most beneficial to my users is some work in and of itself if any of you appreciate the work I'm doing or have visited the uh, Patreon page for the Obrey Project, and you think that these things are valuable, and you know how to build sites, uh, whether it be, you know, there are free sites, um, like blog sites, and then there are ones that really don't cost all that much per month, and even though I haven't hit nearly close to goals that I would need by the day to put days time into this or weeks time into this I am still laboring away as much as I possibly can in what time that I have now that money that comes in um, I certainly can put that into uh, maintaining a website or blog um, so that it could be a little bit better for those who are going to use these materials. So anybody who has any skills in doing that that would like to lend a helping hand because it's only a couple few of us and we're uh, between who of us are, let's say this, I mean we're not necessarily all on the same exact page but what we are is we are people who at least will admit that not everything is right. Uh, not everything we've been told can be proven, and we do not fully understand much. And so, there are a very small amount of us, and we have our hands full with a lot of different things. Um, I'll leave 
you know, some of the personal details of other people that I frequently talk to or work with on this out. I, but myself, I've, I've said this before, I, I run my own business as a carpenter, which is time consuming, especially when you consider like paperwork and stuff that has to be done. It's kind of the worst. And I do remodeling mostly. That's kind of the specialty. And so there's oftentimes a lot of things that I have to look into concerning um, my line of work to get myself up to speed on things that I'm going to be doing. Um, in addition to that, and this has been ongoing for years now, I do have cancer. It's follicular lymphoma. It has progressed quite a lot in years. I have tried many, many uh, naturopathic or homeopathic remedies, and I've looked into this very, very much. And the things that seem like they may be helpful, like for instance, I mean, there's some people who purport to have created modern versions of the Royal Rife machine. Uh, if that is the case, uh, then that's wonderful. But uh, just one of those machines is thousands of dollars. Um, there are a number of naturopathic uh, doctors or healers that purport to have a number of, you know, miraculous tinctures or poultices that many of them are very expensive because a lot of the ingredients are very hard to find. Now, contrast that against the medical industry, which has, they have no interest in curing cancer. They have little interest in keeping people alive, all that, especially ones who they, they see as maybe a problem to their system or not as productive to their system as, you know, others. Uh, and the fact that uh, doctors, especially in the United States, they do have a license to kill. And they do not see repercussions for this. And I've experienced this myself just in the case of my wife and how she almost died from the maltreatment that she experienced in the delivery of our son and everything that happened after that. So... Because a lot of these naturopathic things didn't work, I went back and I said, okay, you know what, I'm willing to try a few things, but I'm not going crazy here. And even though we had had an early biopsy done, um, which I didn't appreciate at all, and we had a diagnosis based on good pathology, uh, they wanted another one. And I didn't want them to continue cutting into me. I don't think cutting open people is the best case scenario. I think that's a, a last resort, if any. If any. Um, remember, the life is in the blood. I believe the Bible before modern science. Um, so they wanted to do another. And I agreed to a guided biopsy and when they get in there for that guided biopsy if the technician doing it is not getting the tissue that she had he had hoped for um boy they really do some damage in there and that is the case with me and <clears throat> since then they did that on the largest node which had swollen amazingly um over the years. And that's why I was at the point of saying, okay, we, we might try something, maybe local radiation, or there were other things. And I have other pre-existing conditions. I've got a blood condition called ITP. I've had probably my whole life. And they haven't taken the time to reassess the type of ITP I have. I mean, there's different types. Well, anyways, so since that was done, um, there's been even worse problems around that area and just me in general sense. So this is really limiting my time there too. And that's why, and I'm just one person, and there's only a few people that I know, talk to, or am working with on these things. It's a tough age. Uh, it's a tough time. Um, most of us are confused about a lot of things. Um, and then there are, there are the masses around us who... That a lot of them seem like they don't want to know enough 
to become confused. They're very happy with <clears throat> what little they know and always keeping their fingers crossed that life will work out okay for them. And I can't do that anymore. That kind of uh, mentality is what led me to over a decade of uh, street drug use because I could not take living a life of such unsurety where there seemed to not be any truth under any rock I turned over. So I have to say I'm so grateful to be on to the information that I'm on to. But it's not an easy road and there aren't any shortcuts. And I would be further along in some of the papers that I am in the middle of writing or presentations that I would like to make. However, unfortunately, any of you who have listened to any of my Obrey videos and presentations, you would know that it is admitted that at least 20% of so-called Hebrew has an unknown, dubious lexicography, and I'm here to tell you it's probably more. So, when I have to look at a Bible verse, I cannot do like a lot of very smart, very talented uh, personalities who are doing Bible-based blogs and videos uh, where they uh, can just pull from various translations and tell you this is what the Bible is saying and then move on with their theories based on that. I'm afraid I cannot do that because I see all the time that the Bible may not be saying a lot of the things that they purport that the Bible is saying. And furthermore, those people who would say, well, for one thing, we have a very good checks and balances system in the fact that we do have the Masoretic text, which the one complete Masoretic text we have is uh, Codex Leningrad. It's uh, right now, it's oftentimes referred to as BHS, the Biblical Biblia Hebraica, uh, and then the it's the name of the guy who has done these revisions, it's like Stuttgart. It's not a name that I can pronounce easily. Anyways, there's that. There are, of course, the Dead Sea Scrolls, which have uh, a number of variations to the BHS. And then you have the Septuagint. And <clears throat> there aren't many copies of the Greek Old Testament. The Septuagint uh, purportedly coming from uh, the same sources as what we would call the Codex Vaticanus when referring to New Testament texts. So it's slim pickings as far as what we have Old Testament-wise. Uh, what we have New Testament-wise is a lot bigger. But, that being said, so if, if you're comparing the two, which a lot of people do, like Nathan83 is big on that, and even very intelligent gentleman who who once his channel and website were going by the name Jews for Hitler. I think he has changed that recently. As he got too much flack over it, of course. Very smart people. Um, but they would use that checks and balances system naturally, right? The problem that I find with using that checks and balances system, which I do. I do look at versions of the Septuagint. Now, there's far more than just the like the Nets and Brentons. There are a number of other people that have done Septuagint translations. Let us not forget there are other various translations of the Bible, Coptic, Latin. Um, these are still minority, and most of them still reflect the basic form 
of both the Septuagint and the BHS, Biblia Hebraica, or Masoretic. Now, the reason I can say that, even though, yeah, there are uh, marked differences, marked differences between the two, is that, strangely enough, there are so many of the same translational decisions made in the two. So, when you look at the Greek underlying the Septuagint, what I find uh, particularly strange is that it seems like whoever made what we call the Septuagint were translating using a Masoretic understanding of the words of the text and the text itself. Now, for anybody who doesn't understand the gravity, <laughs> uh, the weight of that, the weight of that is this. The idea is that the Septuagint was translated from, from more pure Hebrew texts, Obri texts, I'll use Hebrew for now, uh, centuries B.C. While uh, the Masoretic text were said to have been essentially developed because they claim the Masoretes um, standardized the text, or pronunciation and understanding of the text. And they did that <clears throat> with their Masora or Nakud, but that they did this between from about the 7th to 10th century A.D. AD. So, it is believed that there would have been a thousand years between the Septuagint and the Masoretic text. <laughs> However, so many of these words that are admittedly uh, having an unknown lexicography or dubious lexicography, I find it noteworthy that more often than not, and they don't always agree, even the translation of word, uh, specific words, can vary in Septuagint and um, and Masoretic, and also the, the translators that brought them from either Greek or Hebrew may vary, but more often than not, strangely enough, I find so many words in the Septuagint being translated into the Greek from what would seem to be a Masoretic text, not a pure Hebrew text. A lot, a lot of you are really sharp that listen to me, but if the, the weight of the implication of that did not sink in, pause this and think about it until it, it sinks in <clears throat> as far as what that could potentially mean. But even if it doesn't mean that, and I'll just spell it out, if that were the case, and if my observations are well-founded, here's what it could potentially mean. It could potentially mean that not only is the Masoretic text, as we understand it, quasi-recent, um, so would the Septuagint be. Does this mean that something like that would back up Fomenko's theories? Not necessarily. Um, However, if that was the case, I would think, for one thing, we would want to, we would really want to think 
about textural traditions, where they're said to have come from and how old they're really said to be. Because up until this point, we would have had texts that were far older uh, than what we had of the New Testament, texts of the Old Testament. And the Septuagint and the BHS are not all we have, right? But again, Dead Sea Scrolls, I don't think they're nearly as old as they claim. And I think some people have made a good case for that. One, one guy who admittedly, I'll tell you right out of the gate, he is a gatekeeper. But gatekeepers, remember, gatekeepers are valuable because they have to include some amount of truth or nobody would buy anything they say. Um, one of them, who I think has made an, a fantastic case for the Dead Sea Scrolls being quasi-recent, is um, he's uh, Paul Schifranke. He has his own channel. Paul Schifranke, Harry Hubbard, and what they've had to do with not only the, um, the Burroughs Cave, but some other things. Believe me, they're, I don't buy what either one of them says per se in, 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 in as far as their conclusions, but there's some valuable stuff. You got a chicken and bone it. But whatever, let's... We'll go on. So, yeah, I do use both BHS and Septuagint to compare things. And there was something that uh, had always <laughs> confused me. And I, I just wrote it off as me not understanding. But when, uh, when the occurrences of this same problem I had started adding up. Then I had to take a closer look and see if it was just one of those things where I just didn't get it, or if there was any kind of pattern. And so I started looking into this somewhat recently, and I do want to share some things with you because one of the big things that made me take another look at this stuff was actually reading Old Testament passages, realizing that I had read these same passages in the context of the New Testament, and then realizing that the context did not match up in the Old Testament what I was reading with where and why it's quoted in the New Testament. So before anybody becomes very upset, because this is a very upsetting topic, it's upsetting for me. Know that I'm not, I'm not doing this to attack anyone's faith or understanding. Uh, Certainly, many of us hold the faith that we hold because we, for one thing, we understand how full of lies the world is, and there must be something true. And I believe there is something and someone true. I believe that. I think that's the only way that we have our own abilities to detect truth and lies is that we were made in the form and fashion of another who is truthful and who understands and knows all truth. I believe that's the way that we all have a tendency to have a conscience, maybe not all of us, many is that we were made after the form of this creator. So there has to be objective 
truth. There just must. If there's no objective truth, then it's a complete free-for-all. And why should anybody be good? Do you see? There must be objective truth. And we must have some way of understanding that objective truth. Because if we don't have a way of understanding this objective truth, how can we be held accountable for not doing it? Do you understand the conundrum? If we don't fully understand this objective truth, how can a just God hold us accountable? So, I found this chart, nifty chart, at um, uh, the website is called uh, I'll probably get this wrong because the words blend together for a website address. K-A-L-V-E-S-M-A-K-I. It looks like Calvesmackey, calvesmackey.com. It is a chart of passages from the Old Testament that are used in the New Testament at various places. And then what he does is he gives the source so and and he will give the source from from both the Brenton translation of the Septuagint and the AV of the Masoretic. So let's just figure King James. Again, King James is my favorite, isn't my favorite. But the thing is it's the most suited for us tracking words uh through Strong's. And that's why it's kind of one of those necessary things to at least understand the language of King James and to use it, okay? So that's what he does. And before we even start with the first verse and, and look at these source verses in context, we need to understand... Um, a couple of principles concerning Bible study and the interpretation and understanding of texts. Okay, so three biggies that you're going to want to understand about studying the Bible and applying it is eisegesis, exegesis, and hermeneutic. I'm using these because these are the common terms used and they basically describe pretty accurately uh, techniques that are used and techniques that should or should not be used and trying to understand what the Bible is saying. Eisegesis is applying a text or interpreting a text by itself outside of the natural surrounding context and intent of the author. So, we see people do that all the time today. TV preachers are known for doing that. They will, they will eisegete a text. They will read into that text what supports their argument. Fomenko has done this many times. You have to hold people accountable when they eisegete texts. Now, eisegesis is actually spelled E-I-S-E-G-E-S-I-S. -E -E -S -S. But, I do find it um, helpful that it's called eisegesis because eisegesis involves isolating the text. You have to isolate the text from its surrounding textual context in order to successfully eisegete a text. So the next thing is exegesis. Exegesis 
involves actually looking at a text, any text, and considering the context. First and foremost, must consider the context. What is being talked about? Who's being talked to? Um, author and intent. We have to pay attention to the various surrounding factors in order to properly exegete a text. Now, different theologians and apologists have different ideas about what good exegesis is. Um, I would say that good exegesis is just handling it properly with honesty. You may not, or I may not, um, exegete it as well as it could be, but you do your best to stay as honest in this as possible, and you're going to be closer to proper exegesis than someone else who's just trying to use whatever uh, text it is to prove their own pet theories. A hermeneutic. And now hermeneutic, I, I never liked the term because of the root uh, being Hermes. Uh, so the pagan uh, Greek god who gives knowledge, hermeneutic. But anyways, a hermeneutic is a system used to gain consistent understanding of a text, a concept, an idea, a model. It is your system, and you would hope that your her hermeneutic was an honest system and a consistent system. A hermeneutic has to be consistent. If it is not, then you don't really have a hermeneutic. If you're going to break it, you don't have a hermeneutic. All you have is a working hermeneutic where you want it, and then you have a different hermeneutic uh, where you want to prove something else. Essentially, you just fall back into eisegeting, okay? So you have to maintain a consistent hermeneutic. So here we go. This this is the first text uh, uh, listed in the New Testament, quoting back to the Old. It is listed from Matthew one twenty three, the A V version, which is King James. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. That is taken from Isaiah 7.14. In Brenton's, Behold, a virgin shall conceive in the womb, and shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. Isaiah 7.14 from the A.V. Masoretic. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. <clears throat> so if we go to uh, Matthew 1.23... And we'll stay with the AV because we're just looking at things in context, you know. Um, so in Matthew one, we have a we start out with a genealogy forward, and starting in eighteen because we have all these generations up till now. Uh, Matthew one seventeen says the generations from Abraham to David are fourteen generations. David until the carrying away to Babylon are fourteen generations, and from the carrying away of Babylon unto Christ are fourteen generations. Matthew one eighteen. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on the wise when, as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while, she, but while he thought on these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived of her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, 
and you shall call his name Jesus. I don't think so. It would have to be Yeshu. Or, sorry, you show. For he shall save his people from their sins. Now, all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Now, here it is. Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which, being interpreted, is God with us. Now, remember, Matthew is saying that these things all happened, and the angel told Joseph what he told him. It was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord, which should be Yahweh, not Theos, because Theos is used for both instances of Yahweh and Elaim, which is not right, by the prophets saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted as God with us. And then it goes on, Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord bidden him. <clears throat> okay. So we have Isaiah 7.14 in both the Brenton Septuagint and the Masoretic A.V. So let's go back to that. We can stay, since we're already in the A.V., we'll stay with the A.V. I'm going to start at 7.1, Okay. And so this is going to be a lot of reading, but we have to put everything in context. That is the part of keeping a consistent hermeneutic and doing biblical exegesis as opposed to eisegesis. Isaiah 7.1 It came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Eotham, the son of Uziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, the king of Aram, not Syria, Aram, and Pekah, the son of Remliah, king of Yishral, went up to Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it. And it was told the house of Duid, saying, Aram is confederate with Aparim, and his heart was moved in the heart of his people, and the trees of the wood are moved with the wind. Then said Yahweh unto Yeshoya, that's the name of Isaiah, Yeshoya, for go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and Shir Yashub, thy son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool of the highway of the fuller's field, and say unto him, Take heed and be quiet, fear not, neither be faint hearted, for the two tails of these smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of Rezin with Aram, and of the son of Ramlia. Because Aram, Aparim, and the son of Ramlia have taken evil counsel against you, saying, Let's go up against Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach therein for us, and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabil. Thus saith Yahweh Aleim, it shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. For the head of Aram is Damshak, and the head of Damshak is Rezin, and within threescore and five years shall Aprim be broken, and it shall not be a people. And the head of Aprim is Shomrun, and the head of Shomrun is Ramlia's son. If ye will not believe, surely ye shall not be established. This is what Yeshua is going to say to Ahaz. Moreover, Yahweh spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of Yahweh thy Alayim. Ask it either in depth or in height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt Yahweh. And he said, Hear ye now, O house of Duid, it is a small thing for you to weary men, but will ye weary my Alim also? Therefore Adani himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Let's continue at 7.15. Butter and honey shall he eat, 
that he may know to refuse evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse evil and choose the good, the land that you abhor shall be forsaken of both her kings. That would be Yishrael and Aram. Yahweh shall bring upon you and upon your people and upon the father's house days that have not come from the day that Aparim departed from Judah, even the king of Asher. And it shall come to pass in that day that Yahweh shall hiss for the fly that is in the uttermost part of the rivers of Mitzrim, and for the bee that is in the land of Asher, and they shall come and shall rest all of them in the desolate valleys and in the holes of the rocks and upon those thorns and upon all those bushes. Now this is going to continue. He is telling, Yahweh is telling through the prophet Yeshua to King Ahaz that those two kings of Aram and Yisrael will be undone. One more time. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. What child? Isaiah 7.14 Therefore Adoni himself, which is my Lord, the Lord himself, Adun himself, shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know. And then if we want to uh, compare that to Brenton's, no problem. 714 in Brenton's, therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive in the womb, shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. Butter and honey shall he eat before he knows either to prefer evil or choose the good. For before the child shall know good or evil, he refuses evil to choose the good, and the land shall be forsaken which thou art afraid of because of the two kings. But God shall bring upon thee and upon thy people and upon thy house thy father days which thou have never seen from the day that Aparim took away from Judah the king of Asher. So Brenton Septuagint is saying very much the same things afterwards as the AV, which is KJV. So we can go a little bit forward to stay in context. So, in trying to keep with context, I read forward <clears throat> not only the rest of Yeshua 7, but also all of chapter 8. And I wanted to make some quick conclusions, write a few notes down as I went, and just read them off. <clears throat> but as is the usual case with studying the so called Old Testament, I ran into all kinds of issues. This is just a daily thing. This is par for the course. So we have to put this into context and realize a couple of things. One thing is this name that's used, Emmanuel, that in Matthew is said, um, I better just go back to the website real quick. To give you the exact quote out of the AV in Matthew, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. And then we have in parentheses, which means God with us. Matthew 1, KJV plus, and 23. This says, being interpreted. Is God with us? There's no parentheses there. I don't know why he put that. If he's supposed to be taking out of uh, KJV, Theos, Meta, Hemon. All right. So the funny thing is, um, that name from Yeshua 7.14 Omnu Al, 
That's what it is. Omnu Al. If we were to go back, we can just go back in the text and just take a quick look at 714. And, uh, huh, of course, while I'm recording, everything wants to take uh, far longer. I'm sorry about that. So, it wouldn't actually be a pure reading of the text that would bring one to Emmanuel. That would be a Masoretic Emmanuel. Pure reading of these characters would be Omnu Al. Okay? Omnu Al. Now, one thing I want to point out is that when Yahweh is speaking through the prophet Yeshua to the king Ahaz, remember Ahaz is the king of Yehuda, and Yisrael and Aram, specifically Damshak, and their king, are confederate and are against Yehuda. Ahaz is obviously worried about this. Now, when it says that this virgin here, um, first off, that's um, Olme. Olme is just the female version of Olam. Um, Olam is also used in the context of sort of uh, like forever or timeless. I honestly think uh, a really good way to see Olam because there are names for men and women from uh, babies through children and uh, young people to grown adults to the aged. A good way to look at Olam and why it's also used as timeless. Uh, we'll see it often used when you'll see a translation forever or you know something like that you'll see that word why do i think that it's appropriate that it's also used for young man and then you put the i on the end and it's woman um, i would say it's because as everybody knows from your late teens to probably 30 uh everybody seems quite timeless in their youth very healthy like they're never going to die. Um, that is my best reason for that word, which is used for endless or forever, is also young man. And you put that E on the end and you have young woman. <clears throat> it does not have to mean one that has not had sex. Now this era, yes, it's conceive, and she shall have a child, Ben, now, it says, and Karath, so, she'll name it. Shem, ooh, his name, Omnu Al. So, it doesn't say that Yeshua the prophet or King Ahaz. Why would she name it Omnu Al? I would say the same reason she would name the child Omnu Al would be <clears throat> very similar to why the wife of one of the sons of Oli, which people usually say Eli in the days of uh, Shemuel, his two sons, Oli's two sons, evil wicked sons, they both, remember, they die at a battle and the ark is taken. And one of their wives is, I'm not sure if it's Hophni or Phineas' wife, probably Phineas' wife is pregnant. She, when she hears about this, that the ark's taken, he's killed. They lost the battle, she falls down, and she <clears throat> delivers a child. And she names that child, the English translation is Ichabod. Kabod, glory. E, kabod, no glory. <clears throat> because she says the glory of 
Alaim has left us. That's why she names the child that. So, this young woman's going to name this child Omnu Al. Now, there are many possibilities in this word. For instance, Al. Al, 408, could be no, not, never, or nothing. I've checked these contexts and their correct contexts. It's not Al with something else added onto it, which is often the case in Strong's. Okay, so Al, 408, is no, not, never, or nothing, occurs 12 times. Al as God, God-like, angel, power. It's used for men, strength, or powerful one. Wide variety. It really is, which is why you usually will see Yahweh, the living God, as Elaim. But, anyways, 410 Al is uh, it occurs 400 or no 245 times in various ways not always as just God and not always referring to him could be little gods and it doesn't always have to be God remember that very wide variety of applications in that one word seems like that should be listed in multiple different ways instead of all together but Strong's, anyone will find as they dig deeper, has not much rhyme nor reason. Now, Al, 411, could be these or those, and it appears that way nine times. Al, uh, 413, and these are the Hebrew codes. If you wanted to check these, you'd have to punch in H, 413. Could mean to or towards. And they say that happens 38 times. I am shocked because I think it happens a lot more than that. I see it constantly. That doesn't seem right. <clears throat> Anyways, so that's a wide variety of Al. Now, Om. Om 5971 is people. And it happens to occur 1,862 times as people. Ohm as 5973, meaning with, occurs 26 times. Now there's also an ome, and when you're going to combine roots or put a suffix on, like in the case of om nu al, the nu, every time I've ever seen it, us or our, om nu al, well anyway, sometimes you will drop an end, specifically if you had something like Ome 5980, which the short strong's definition would be juxtaposition against. So you could say one building was Ome the other, which so then it's similar to with, isn't it? But here's the thing you have to trust the Masoretes and lexicographers and translators since, most of which had a bent to a certain type of theology, especially the Masoretes. <sighs> okay. So, what could it mean? I mean, we could either take that passage from Matthew where it says being interpreted is God with us. Well, here's the thing about the New Testament that almost every theologian, apologist, whomever are going to say is that Scripture at the time the New Testament was written was the whole fullness of, you know, the Hebrew Scriptures. So, I would think that they would want to practice those same rules or principles like no eisegesis, much good exegesis, and uh, a certain consistency. Truth does not fear scrutiny, and we must be consistent. So, here's what it breaks down to. The reason that we would look back and read uh, Yeshua 714 
and the rest of that chapter and then chapter 8 and stick that uh, con concept and context of Emmanuel in there as we're reading is because we're probably more familiar with Matthew 123. Now I say this because I caught myself reading this and was not paying attention or recalling Matthew 123 at the time and I did not immediately apply that especially when I was looking at it in pure form as Omnu Al. I didn't recall Emmanuel. It's insane that when you look at the text, I mean, they stick it in here too. I mean, the, the, the people that, that at Q Bible, they basically use AV English language with ad hoc Hebrew terminology in here for names and specific, you know, proper nouns. But they stick Emmanuel in there. It's interesting. The Masoretic using the Masoretic pronunciations. Do you think the New Testament writers would have? If the Masoretes standardized this in the 7th to 10th century, then we would have to assume that that was the standard language in the 1st century. But they don't exactly say that. I mean, if you look at the, the Greek in Matthew, we have Matthew one twenty three. The Greek, as admitted, especially with the name Jesus, everybody who wants to justify using this word, this name Jesus, wants to say, well, Greek doesn't have a number of equivalents. So, who's to prove that the Greek rendering of this has any correlation to a pronunciation which the the Masoretes uh, dictated by way of fiat in what was supposedly the 7th through the 10th century. But um, back to it. So she's going to name the child that. She's going to name the child that for a certain reason. And it, it explains this in the rest of this chapter and find it in the next chapter. But... Is that what Omnu Al means? Does that mean God with us? Well, first off, you have to assume that the Om there is the 5973 Om with, which occurs 26 times. With, and usually the new is our, not us. Typically, it would be, it would be easier to say, I suppose. Like you have um, Elayinu, which would be our Elayim, God. So is it more likely that that Om is with when Om is used as people at least a thousand times as many, well, not a thousand times as many, because that, that would be 26,000. How about at least 1,830 times more Om appears as people than with? So that first word, Omnu, it would be entirely acceptable to say it's our people. Now, the Al. As I said, it, it has been used as no, not, or never. It's used as God, God-like, angel, powers. It's used as these or those. And it is used as to or towards a lot. I'm going to say, based on the context of everything I read past uh, 714 and, and in 8, that it looks like to me, when I'm just reading this text, because I'm trying to look at these words, Om Nual, in context, I'm, I'm just leaving Matthew 123 over, over there for now. Uh, okay? We have to do that. 
when we want to exegete. And we want to be consistent. We want to understand this, okay? It's saying that before this child even knows to refuse evil or embrace good, that these two kings shall be destroyed, wasted, done away. And then it goes on in the rest of 7 and 8 to describe how Asher, or called Assyria, would be coming up against those two kings. And it goes on, of course, and says that not only that, but he would also be flooding the land of Judah, translated Judah, as well. <clears throat> so the mother's going to name the child this. Would she be naming the child this as in our people, God? With the emphasis on our? Our people, God. Or, I've never seen Al used after a noun to be towards. So I don't know so much about our people towards or to our people as in choosing. Our people empowered. The not is one of those unlikely. Our people not. And here's why. Because in Hosea 1.9, he names one of the children he has with the prostitute, La O me, not my people. So if it was being used as not, you would expect it to be after the subject, people. So, is it our people, God? Obviously, in context, we're seeing that Yahweh is going to choose Yehuda, and he is going to break the kings of Yisrael and Aram by using the king of Ashur. That's what's going on here. So, that's what you're going to find if you read 7 uh, from 14 out to the end. And then if you go into chapter 8, it's very interesting because starting, Yeshua is told to take a large book or scroll and he's told to write these words in it with these witnesses, these words, Mer, Shalal, Hashe. Baz. They're given meanings as in uh, mare, hasten quickly. That can be dowry as well for a woman. It's used often as that. The shalal, plunder, spoil mostly. Okay, then we got hashe, she usually uses hurry, and buzz. Again, pray. Now, are these synonyms? They may be. They certainly are using very different characters, but there's nothing saying that the Obri language isn't full of synonyms and homonyms and antonyms, just like English and other languages have those things in it. So, quickly plunder spoil. Hurry to pray. Pray is in, uh, <clears throat> like an animal's prey. And then he says in 8.3, And I went unto the... <laughs> Excuse me. The prophetess, uh, Nabiye. Now, the prophetess, Nabiye, probably meaning his wife, um, would also be an Olme. She conceived she bare a son. He said, Yahweh said to me, he said to me, call his name. That same <clears throat> Mer Shalal Hashbaz. 
He says, before the child shall have knowledge to cry, my father and mother, the riches of Damshak, the spoil of Shumrun, shall be taken away before the king of Ashur. He spoke to me again, saying, For as much as this people refuses the waters of Shelah that go softly and rejoice in Ritzin and Ramlia. Oh, and the son of Ramlia. Ramlia, u son. Anyways. Now, therefore, behold, Yahweh brings up upon them the waters of the river strong. And I'm reading the English, and honest to goodness, I, I swear, with my hand up in the air, right hand up in the air, so many of these things are not as they seem in these English translations. I'm so sorry to tell you. And they can be so many varied things. And we are getting the determination of what these things commonly are from Masoretic scribes. If you're comfortable with that, that's your issue. So, and the many in the king of Ashur, and all his glory, he shall come up over, and his channel shall go over all his banks. Some of this is really shoddy stuff. What's interesting, Emmanuel, we see it again. He shall pass through Yehuda. He shall overflow and go over. He shall reach even to the neck, and the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breath of thy land, O Emmanuel. Really? Oh, Emmanuel, that's interesting because what we see here, um, these last few words, we got um, Kanapiyu, Mela, Rahab, Aratsak, and then Omnu Al. The broadness of your land, fullness edge of the broadness of your land, and then it just says Omnu Al. There is not an exclamation beforehand, <coughs> excuse me, like Ene, to say, oh, or behold, Emmanuel. No, it's just Omnu Al. After this uh, description of what he's going to do, the breadth of your land, Omnu Al. Now, in that context, huh. Is he saying, God with us? Is he speaking to the people? He shall pass through, you know, Judah. Who is he talking to? Omnuel. In context, it's hard to say. It really is. Now, they translate it here in this ad hoc uh, King James with Hebrew as Emmanuel in 8.8. Through the broadness of their land. Actually, it's their their land. Through the broadness of their land. You they shall overflow and go over, shall reach even unto the neck and the stretching out of his wings. Yep. And it'll come to pass that he'll expand the extremities, the full broadness of their land. I would say that the Omnu Al there is a bit mysterious. This is the first time it appears since 714. But there it is again. Omnu Al. Was there supposed to be a gap? And then we would see God with us? I'm just asking these questions. What's weird is, if you float over Omnuel, it's listed as 6,005 in Strong's. And Strong's lists 714 and 88 as only two occurrences of this Omnuel. What well, also occurs in 810? Take counsel together, and it shall come to naught. Speak the word, and it shall not stand. For, and this is how they're translating it, for. Al is with us. Why would that be? That verse doesn't even make sense. Take counsel together and it shall come to naught. Speak the word and it shall not stand. For Al is with us. <sighs> 
Maybe it does. Maybe what he's saying is, well, you see, Yehuda was also wicked. I mean, they weren't preserved for their goodness, that's for sure. They were preserved for other reasons. They weren't saved in the days of um, Hezekiah for their goodness. But it was for other reasons. But Omnu Al, it's right here. Why didn't the Strongs list that again? For Omnu Al. For our people, Al, I'm not saying that I've got the answers. I'm saying that contextually and syntactically, it's all a little strange. But that's what's going on in Isaiah 7 and Isaiah 8. Yeshua, Isaiah, asked Ahaz, Ahaz. He said, ask a sign of Yahweh, anything. Oh, I won't do that. I won't tempt him. I'm not going to tempt him. I'm not going to test him. And that's where he, essentially, in layman's or common terms, he says, good grief. And he says, well, here, I'm going to give you a sign anyways. An olame, a young woman, she'll conceive, give birth, and she'll name this child Omnu Al. Because before the child knows, he says, butter and honey will he eat. By the way, if you read forward in 7, there's more to be said about why that is. And this is happening contemporary. At that time, at Ahaz's time, it just wouldn't make a lot of sense to give him that sign without it coming to pass in his time. And you can see that in 7. If you read forward, he says, because before he's old enough, to know to ch choose good and to not choose evil, that Yahweh would do away with those two kings. Matthew one twenty one, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Um, Jesus doesn't mean anything. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of Kyrios, hmm, by the prophet, saying, and the, he's not given the prophet, but this is basically the only place they say it could come from, unless there's a book that we don't know about, and this is in a different context, by the way. If you click on Matthew 123, so you only have 714 and 88 as far as Emmanuel goes. And again, 88. And now, of course, 9, 6, and 7 are a different story. However, I'm reading through it real quick to see if we would have people in here or something that could be said as Omnu Al. No. Isaiah 12, 12. God's my salvation. I'll trust, not be afraid. My strength, my song. Okay, but no. And then boom, they're up into John. They're already back in the New Testament. And then to Acts. All right. So behold, a virgin shall be with child. Bring forth a son. Now, where do you get this? They shall call. Just call. Autos. Anoma. Emmanuel. And that's L. E L L. Not Al, as it should be. You're going to find these things out the more you choose to look at Masoretic fiat pronunciations of certain characters. 
and how they seem that they should be pronounced if we were just using simple logic and consistency. So behold, a virgin shall be of a child, and they shall bring forth a son, call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted as God with us. <clears throat> this is what Matthew's writing. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of, of Kyrios. And there's much to say about Kyrios and Theos at some point in time. And then after that says, Joseph being raised from sleep did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him. So, either this is a terrible misuse of that portion of Scripture in Yeshua 7.14, or this was supposed to be referenced to something else and the wording was a little bit different in the original language that it was written in, and uh, they've kind of, uh, they changed it around a bit when it went to the Greek. And I just checked Shem Tob's Hebrew Matthew just to see if there was something <laughs> that wasn't well understood um, about what's being said here, you know. Uh, and the thing is, when you, when you look at Shem Tov, the thing is, there's they're still quoting in here from 22 to 23. It's a quote saying, um, you get that no matter what manuscript you're going to. And the reason I checked it and why that matters is because if it was considering the verse or verses before, that would be a different subject altogether. Okay? Um, and she shall bring forth a son, call his name Yosho, for he shall save his people from their sins. All this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of Yahweh, not curious, by the prophet. And then they have prophets saying, and then there's this in here. But this verse here, Matthew 123, I'm just, I'm sorry to say, because maybe that proves just how stupid I am. I don't see the context. I'm so sorry to say that. I just don't see the context. And I don't see it with a number of other quotes either. It bothers me that I don't. But I'm not. I'm, I have to be honest. I've got to be 100% honest here. And some I do. Some, I see the context, and I get it. The answer to this, before this greatly upsets too many people, there can be many different answers to this. Just keep that in mind. One of them being that a lot of New Testament writings have been noodled with quite a bit. And... There are so many who say that that's just so not possible. Because of all those copies, you know, the massive amounts of copies from Byzantium. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Well, tell me this. Every empire that I've ever seen in our modern era, England and America, good examples, everywhere where, where we have established a presence or colonialized, and then before us, maybe, say, France or Spain, any empire 
that has colonialized. Uh, those people, where they set up shop, they have to soon learn their language for the sake of commerce under the auspices of that empire. Judea was supposed to be ruled over by Rome for some time by this time, as would all of the areas around where all of these books were supposedly being spread to, being written for all these different people, yet they say they'd be written in Greek. Even the Book of Romans <laughs> now Rome spoke a language called Latin. Rome was not Greece. Greece was Greece. Greece spoke Greek. Rome spoke Latin. So why is everybody so insistent that wherever the original autographs happen to be, if they exist, that they had to have been in Greek? I would expect most everybody to be speaking Latin. I mean, yeah, Greek may have survived and lingered, but if you wanted to conduct commerce in that empire, and if Rome was the atrocious, hard-handed beast that we think that they were, you bet everybody would have known Latin, would have spoke Latin. Where's all the Latin copies? Before the first one was made a few hundred years later, so it's said. There are possibilities that don't include the New Testament being wrong or lying or something. You see, there are possibilities. That doesn't have to be the only possibility. But these are things. These are things I have noticed. And so I've got to point them out. If you've followed this, or if you go and read it yourself, you think I'm wrong, that's fine. Tell me. You can explain that to me. Try to make it as brief as possible in the comments, but you know, hey, go ahead. I mean, take a stab at it. But, you know, while I'm working on all these other things, it's about high time. This has been itching at me for a long time, a lot of these quotes. And I know it's, I know it's a big deal because it's a big deal to me, too. I don't want to be the guy who points this stuff out. Because I think the first thing people are going to think is that I'm saying that I think something is bogus. Well, what I think is the most likely candidate for being bogus is certain manuscript traditions and how we believe uh, certain manuscripts were initially written and how they've survived and come to us. That could be a real issue. The reason being is there is a number of other overwhelming bits of information that tell me um, that you show being the correct Mashiach for Yisrael is correct. So there's plenty of evidence that tells me that this all does harmonize, but there is a ton that tells me that that quote is out of context in some way, and if I don't have some way of understanding it, you see, I'm lost, and I would think that you were too, if you can't understand why these quotes are used. So, until next time, I wish all of you very, very well. Okay? Take care.